One thing stands clear, online fraud is more pervasive than the average Nigerian realizes. Everyone of us know a Yahweh person. You know somebody that is into Yahweh Yahweh. Online fraud in Nigeria is a pandemic. Should we excuse Yahoo Yahoo on the basis of poverty in the nation? Yes, they are doing their work. Hmm? Yahoo Yahoo, they are doing their work. Uh -huh. By law, we don't generally consider excuses. What about music? So when a song comes up, I go and sit down. How is corporate Yahoo Yahoo, that is online investment scam, wrecking the finances of Nigerians? That if both my parents come back from the dead, and they wanted to go into a business with me in Nigeria. I wouldn't. 60 years ago, the electronic computer made its first appearance in Nigeria. Since then, computers have become much smaller, so small that they can fit in our palms and even be strapped on our wrists. Computer-associated technologies the internet and the World Wide Web have made it possible for every computer device in the world to be connected to each other. These technologies have also come to give my country a reputation. A reputation for fraud. Today, I start my work day on my laptop and what's on my mind is online fraud in Nigeria. But it's not just that. It's the fact that online fraud has become accepted as part of our culture. So cultural that an increasing number of young people in Nigeria do not think that there is anything wrong with online fraud. In the latter part of 2021, our local church embarked on an outreach to some secondary schools in Lagos State. We called it Project Inspire. The project involved teaching the students in the schools digital and non-digital skills. One of the skills we touched on was cyber safety. That led to a conversation on online fraud and we asked the students about their views on online fraud. That's Yahoo Yahoo. In one of the schools, we did a poll on online fraud and at least one third of the students said that they did not think that there was anything wrong in online fraud. I actually tweeted about it at the time. So if you stay on the social media pages of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, you'll see that nearly every workday there is a post about internet fraudsters who have been arrested or convicted. In different states, Sokoto, Cross River, Ogun, Rivers, Lagos, Kwara, Anambra, Oyo, Oshun, Benue, Enugu, Abuja, hundreds of people convicted for internet fraud-related offences. With the prevalence of online fraud in Nigeria and its global reach, in spite of the convictions and arrests we see by EFCC every single day, would it be safe to say that it is a pandemic or are we just exaggerating here? It's definitely not an exaggeration. Online fraud in Nigeria, uh, based on the data we gathered for this project, is clearly a pandemic like COVID or SARS or Ebola in terms of its rate of growth um, and how widespread it has become. In fact, commentators in other jurisdictions currently refer to online fraud from Nigeria as a global pandemic. These greedy scammers are slicker than ever. To better hide their tracks, they've spread from Nigeria to become a global pandemic. To get a very detailed understanding of the scale of the problem of online fraud in Nigeria, we spoke to experts in several relevant fields. Confidence Stavely has been at the forefront of educating Nigerians and Africans generally on cyber safety. She's an award-winning cybersecurity expert and the executive director of CyberSafe Foundation. CyberSafe Foundation is one of the world's leading cybersecurity nonprofits. Its Cyber Girls training program was recently adopted as part of the White House's cyber strategy. It's definitely not an exaggeration, and these are my own indicators for making that sort of statement. First, it's become a norm. How do you know something has become a norm? We no longer question certain things. We no longer question means of livelihood. We no longer question people 
sudden progress. Um, I mean, there have been scenarios where people say this, and I don't doubt it. Where, and we've seen videos where young men are spraying foreign currencies that you're not—they're not doing any job, you know, that they can we can put their hands on. You know, they're driving flashy cars, they're coming home buying properties and very expensive things for their parents as gifts, and it, it's all well and good. We also spoke to Adedoin Adedeji. Adedoin is an information technology consultant and the chief operating officer of International Center for Leadership Development, Nigeria, ICLDNG. Every one of us knows a Yahoo person. You know somebody that is into Yahoo, Yahoo, you know. Do you understand? So, but we are in a society where there's no consequences, so anything goes. are on our way to the streets to just basically get the public opinion on internet fraud, Yahoo Yahoo online scam, to know what the layman thinks it is and how they feel about it more or less. We're heading to the streets right now. Most of youths out there now believe in that Yahoo so much. Though I can't blame them. EFCC they are doing their work. Hmm? Yahoo Yahoo they are doing their work. Uh -huh. So you you chasing Yahoo Yahoo boys that they are doing Yahoo Yahoo. Uh, do you have other works to give them? If you have other works to give them, uh, you can you can stop them from doing their work. Online fraud is the subject of many songs that we all dance to. Previously, these songs used to generate furore, but now we seem powerless to them. Even as far as vendors, some vendors will tell you that, oh, I mean, I've, I've seen vendors that will tell me, oh, my market is Yahoo Boys. They will say it with their full chest, without any apologies. They will tell you, oh, I'm this business I'm doing, I'm not doing it for. Uh, nine to five people I'm doing for the Yahoo boys. They mm -hmm. get Yahoo, I'm doing, you understand? Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's really that bad. There have also been several reports of Nigerian parents actively supporting the fraudulent activities of their children and parents who either overlook the fraudulent activities of their children or do little to probe the source of their children's sudden wealth. We have stopped being a society that asks questions. Because I remember the, growing up, my um, occasionally my dad do check our bag when we were growing up. He do check our school bag, and if he says any item that is that that does not belong to you in any way, he would ask you, "How did this thing get into your bag?" Uh, it's for my friend. It's for my. Uh, come explain you why why is your friend's uh, cup or why is your friend's this? Why is he in your bag? Come explain. Think about we we have a society today that we would rather go with material things than ask ourselves what what do you do for a living how do you survive uh what what does this 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 set of people what do they do maybe they have a different set of parents for mine though because mine will ask you in the middle after you've done all this uh -huh. so what do you say you're doing again you know to so able to have that i mean we, we've lost as, a, as a, a society we've lost our moral compass so much so that i've heard things about mothers praying for their sons to pick clients Online fraud was also a major excuse exploited by the special anti-robbery squad, SARS, when its officers harassed Nigerian youths. For this work, we are also touching on the issue of investment scams. In the last few years, billions of Naira have been lost to scams operated by corporate Yahoo Yahoo boys who have promoted agri-tech, crypto, and forex investment scams. A lot of Nigerians assume that online fraud affects just foreigners. That is not the case at all. Cyber fraudsters frequently target Nigerians as well. Yeah, I've been scammed. I've been scammed. But I just take it as part of experience of life, you know. Yeah, they have fraud me so many times. So I've been, uh, I've been the victim. So it's not it's not polite. It's not good. I've been scammed several, and uh, on on different occasions, 
if I, I begin to doubt even the banks where we, we put our money with, you know, sometimes we're wondering how they got to get our information. Yearly, billions of Naira are lost by banks, other financial institutions, and non-financial institutions in Nigeria. If I was to answer the questions from the angle of the service providers or companies that, you know, would experience these breaches very often, I would say that the business of digital is now a trust business. And um, what a breach says is that um, I've given you my data, I've given you my money or something along those lines, and someone has come to steal it from you, I can't trust you anymore, right? So there is really no strong enough incentive for that reporting or that um, for that news to be put out, especially where um, the law or the, le the legal basis for doing that does not make it compulsory for them to do that. I would say from many perspectives, um, these breaches have been happening and they are grossly underreported because of all of these factors that I've, I've, I've mentioned. Today, many of the online fraudsters are resorting to charms and rituals to carry out their acts. This is referred to as Yahoo Plus. And some people, this Yahoo thing is not even paying them like before. They are going to Shaman to do ritual. And they are just using this Yahoo, like, just to cover face that night. So this Yahoo thing is going different ways. I come to that uh, uh, I've seen somebody that you can use. These rituals are meant to make the participants successful by being more believable or versatile in their fraudulent activities. Some of the charms are also to help the participant escape detection by law enforcement. There is evidence in the public space that many of these rituals involve the use of human lives or human body parts. Many young females have lost their lives as victims of these fetish activities and many of the native doctors who make the charms have become rich. With the internet, Nigerians have done and undone things. We have built companies that digitized analog processes, innovated new approaches altogether, and created value for individuals, companies, and the country at large. Thanks to the internet, Nigerians have mobilized to exercise free speech, put politicians and people in power on their toes. We have also exported evils, and one of those is what has become internationally known as the Nigerian scam. While we have the Shola Akinladis, Burna Boys, and Hilda Bassis, who have given the country a positive spotlight for innovation and creativity, we also have the Hush Puppies, who Bloomberg calls the world's flashiest scammer, the Woodburys and Skills Olatunji, who have taken online fraud global. Apprenticeship used to be a thing reserved for aspiring traders who will be taught and coached for a trade or skill. Today, we have houses called HKs, where young boys are camped and provided with laptops and internet access, and they undergo training in fraud. God, Dr. Bukola Uche is an expert in criminal justice. She is a lecturer with the Faculty of Law, University of Ibadan, and a staff clinician with the Women's Law Clinic at the faculty. Whether we like it or not, we live in a community. And more often than not, most crimes are learned. So if we are talking about the proliferation of online fraud, and you, it may have started with one person, and then we see it as um, it is expanding now, it's growing. The major cause of this is that, one, the society is being conditioned to accept it. You see the creation of on, uh, camps where the, in the Yoruba term, Egwa Adubo, an elder in the society, in the community, brings young children together, they provide food, they give them laptops, and they teach them the ways. And so they learn from there. How do you curb, you know, it becomes more difficult to curb online fraud because now they are learning it. And then we have this instance where uh, young people are taught that um, because they are engaging in online fraud, they are recovering stolen wealth 
from other jurisdictions. And you see, that is a very mistaken perception because the people you are stealing from have done no wrong. They have not been involved in slavery. So you, you, no, the end does not justify the means in terms of online fraud because you are actually, it's a crime. They are given information to work with in what is known as format. So I saw this boy online yesterday. E for energy. I started with some drill drums. A casual watch of this TikTok video will leave the observer thinking that this is just another TikTok video on music production. It's not. The audio is a cover for the fact that the video is an advertisement of Yahoo Yahoo formats being sold on TikTok. And more often than not, they start with dating scams. These romance scams appear to be the basis of the majority of the prosecutions by the EFCC, as most of the convictions they secure border on impersonation and fraudulent misrepresentation. Some of them have to do with deception of, you know, love relationships that actually don't exist. Someone yeah. finds you on, say, a dating app or uh, a quick messaging app and then begins to be all mushy and says, yeah, X, Y, Z, uh, you know, they're based in one side of the world when they are not based in that part of the world. It's a fake picture and things like that. So they create a picture to the other person of being loved by someone who is an ideal lover in their eyes and then they find out that that person is a complete different person or that that person doesn't have any of such emotions but that other person who is defrauding another person in another part of the world um, begins to get asked and get you know a lot of financial favors from the other party um, this can run from thousands into hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of losses that we've typically seen over time there is a darker side to the issue of romance scams, and that is the issue of sextortion. Ifama Shulanke is a lawyer and the founder of Justice Beyond Hashtags Foundation that caters to the rights of women who are victims of sexual abuse. Justice Beyond Hashtags has provided support to many victims of sextortion. Sextortion is um, a combination of two words, sexual extortion. Um, I mean, extorting someone in a sexual manner. It's an instance where someone's image, um, usually explicit, their nudes, their photos, their videos, are essentially used as a bargaining chip or a leverage against them by perpetrators of crimes of blackmail to obtain some kind of advantage over you know the owners of these pictures the advantages could either be monetary or essentially to have the victims be at a place where they do things um, in exchange for silence with respect to those explicit videos pictures and um, yes that's essentially what it's about it's it's something that is prevalent online um, so I would say it's an online crime. Unable to take the weight of the pain from seeing private pictures or videos made public, some victims have resorted to self-harm or suicide. This issue is further tainting Nigeria's reputation on the global scene. Tonight, two Nigerians in U.S. custody appearing in federal court today. Authorities say they ran a sextortion scheme that targeted 100 people, including Jordan DeMay, a 17-year-old high school athlete bound for college who shot himself to death last year. Jordan's mother living any parent's worst nightmare. Interestingly, many of the perpetrators of online fraud do not realize that their crimes are transnational crimes. The kind of internet fraud that they engaged in was um, to pose as women, to get young boys in America, teenagers, to share their explicit pictures, right? And in this particular very unfortunate case of um, Jordan Dime, they made him share his pictures and you know began to extort him try to get money from him and all of that and unfortunately he killed himself in america so he died in america the the internet fraud led to his death so it's not just about what they did it's about what it has cost or what it, it has led to 
so because Jordan died in America and they would have to find out how it happened in America it's important that those that committed the offense in Nigeria or were alleged to have committed the offense in Nigeria will be moved from Nigeria to the US to be tried properly for that offense while romance scams and sextortions are popular among fraudsters. They are largely the entry-level fraud by Nigerian fraudsters because the returns from those crimes are usually small compared to other crimes. At the top of online fraudulent schemes is business email compromise. BEC. It involves schemes in which fraudsters defraud companies and organizations by compromising emails. Hush Puppy was heavily involved in BEC scams. Online fraud is however not limited to romance scams, sextortion and BECs. With the changing face of technology, the schemes and the means are evolving every day. It will only get worse because you keep having to devise new strategies and more often than not, it, start go, it starts going down. It starts, you start taking a downward turn. Today, it is, you are trying to scam for $2,000. Tomorrow, it becomes $50,000. Next, tomorrow, such a person is willing to kill. We wanted to understand the acceptance level of online fraud by Nigerian teenagers. We also wanted to understand the exposure of the teenagers to fraudsters in their vicinity. Oaks Intelligence has been conducting surveys and gathering data on economic matters across Nigeria. They agreed to partner with us for our survey project. We spoke with Toby Loba Babajide from Oaks Intelligence. Toby Loba is a data analyst and coordinated the Online Fraud Perception Survey. The survey was conducted in 85 local governments across the six states and federal capital territory of the country. We made sure that every state of the country was covered so that our responses are representative of each of these states. We had a total number of 2,683 responses. We asked the children about their view on online fraud and whether or not they may be an excuse for engaging in online fraud. One in every four of the teenagers said that Yahoo Yahoo is bad, but there may be an excuse for it. We also asked the children if they knew anyone around them, family member, neighbor, or someone who engages in online fraud. For this question, we focus specifically on male respondents. We also know that as much as online fraud in Nigeria is a national issue, its prevalence varies across geopolitical regions in Nigeria. When we broke down the responses of the male respondents by geopolitical zones, 41% of the male respondents in the Southwest reported knowing someone involved in online fraud, 40% in the South-South, 27% in the North Central, 26% in the Southeast, 19% in the Northeast, 16% in the Northwest. We also asked the teenagers if they had ever engaged in online better. At least one in every four male students said that they had engaged in online betting. Another very worrisome result was that relating to sexting. At least one in every 10 teenagers stated that they had sent a nude or semi-nude picture of themselves to someone online. Looking at the results specifically for male students, we see that the, the higher number of them who know someone, either a relative, neighbor or friend, who participates in online fraud. In the Southeast, one in three students knows someone in the south south and southwest two in every five students know someone who participates in online fraud however in the north central part of the country just one in three students know someone who participates in online fraud in the northeast just one in five while in the northwestern part of the country three in 20 students know someone who participates in online fraud we sat down with a former online fraudster who agreed to speak with us on the condition that we do not reveal his face and we change his voice. For the purpose of this interview, we'll call him Steve. How did you get into Yahoo Yahoo working boy things? It was, it was just like a play thing. Me and my friends, that was back then in school. So, you know, I was, I was not, I came from a very, not like, not like, a, my, my background was not too good. It wasn't too good. Like um, I needed to do stuff for, myself because you know my dad just asked you to go to school no one give you money for stuff and nothing so you have to do stuff so when i was in the school i now find out i saw my friends doing stuff and they were like looking good mm -hmm. cashing out doing stuff they start telling me that there's small small stuff that they are doing all yes they are calling it dating mm -hmm. they call it dating so i now say what is it what is it about and i said it's gay versus man like versus gay stuff so i'll be using some of them so they give me the format i started 
one in it. First time I cash out. So little thing I cash out. First was hundred dollar. Mm -hmm. yes, cash out hundred dollar. It was something then. Now I cash out another hundred dollar. So it was it was good. Mm -hmm. I even forgot that I was in school. So I now finally I, I was I said to myself, well finally I got something. Mm -hmm. So you know and then traveling, leaving the family to another state. I now find out that it just it was just like a, a free zone for me to also. Mm -hmm. I find out I was mixed with a lot of people, a lot of boys that's working. They bring updates, new updates. I mean, we now the more you grow, the more you see new updates. Mm -hmm. New updates now come to the street. I now go into it, start working on it. I had, I needed to do I needed to cash out good money, like to be good. So they now said we have to do one or two stuff, like one or two stuff you have to some sacrifice you need to do for you to go to the top there and the more you to me it wasn't um, comfortable to me to do anything because of the conditions and all that so I decided to I started restricting my moves with them mm -hmm. and because they knew that I'm not relevant like before that usual way so you know one thing about guys when they saw things like that they would think you're a betrayer yeah. so they, you're against them so they're like they would think that you're against them so though they are you, they might not need you in that midst again. For me, I do it. I do it, but I have ideas on other jobs, like so many works. Which came in to your boys' camp. Mm -hmm. They also, if this thing I'm telling you is updated, which gave you said it outside, mm -hmm. they will look here again. You get mm -hmm. so they will think you you know how city go. Mm -hmm. So they camp boys with the HK, you learn from there. You go learn everything I know, I will teach you, everything you know, you will teach me. Mm -hmm. We will teach ourselves. Then anybody that cash out is the boss for that time. If I force you cash out, I don't be boss that day. If you can't cash out, now you go be your guy too. So that's how it is. Now you go carry everybody, go ball. Mm -hmm. if, if you cash out like, let's say $5,000, you go ball everybody, but you will credit everybody. Mm -hmm. So now, so we will credit everybody. We will launch for a good hotel. Mm -hmm. We will eat the money, we will finish, we will start to the bomb again. What I mean is, it's connect. I you share. There's one thing you share. There's connection you share. Mm -hmm. You don't need to stay one place. Mm -hmm. You need to move. So because government also they are tracking you. Mm -hmm. So because of that, you don't need to stay one place. That's when you see them lodge. They will pack from there. They go another place. We call it scam. Mm -hmm. But in a year with us streets, we call it business. Mm -hmm. If you if you work in a bank and you're, I know that you're sincere. You're good. I can be using you. To be cashing out, but I'll be paying you. That's the way you see some people working in a bank. Maybe just normal stuff, be driving like better lectures, better ride. And you'll be asking, am I not working in the same bank? Steve also alleged that many online fraudsters in Nigeria operate under the protection of some rogue law enforcement officials. He emphasized the role of middlemen, known as pickers, in online fraud operations, many of whom he said are bank officials. Nigeria has a very bad reputation on the global scene for online fraud. Uche Chuku Ulise is a lawyer and compliance official who works with a fintech company that operates in several countries. As a compliance official, he is tasked with detecting and handling suspected fraudulent transactions. So there are certain regions that are categorized as low-risk jurisdictions. You have certain environments that are categorized as medium-risk. And of course, you have regions that are categorized as high-risk. Of course, you know the answers to you. You can think of you know, possible countries that will fall under the risk of or in the list of high risk. So for example, you could have a situation whereby Nigeria, which falls under high risk, for example, for most um, financial institutions, the, the, the Nigerian residents, because most times it, 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 it does, it deals with jurisdiction and not nationality per se. Yeah. So if you're a Nigerian, but you're not residing in Nigeria, okay. these rules may not apply. Um, if you reside in a high risk jurisdiction, for example, you will not be able to access, let's say, um, multi currency accounts or be able to get like um, um, cards. I'll give you a scenario of how bad it is. Personally, just a few days ago, I was looking to travel to another part of you know, America and I bought a ticket and 
my ticket was automatically flagged so i couldn't when i mean automatically flagged, i couldn't check in online um i had to go to the airport with the card that i used to book that flight and id as well to prove that i am who i say i am now after quizzing quite a lot they did not say it was a nigerian problem but the lady told me very clearly that um some regions are automatically flagged to make sure that they double check that the person who booked that ticket actually is using their card so that's a very clear case of um of being um of the issues around cyber fraud and our reputation uh, so that's one of several but there are many people that are not able to take up um, jobs you know once they mention that they are nigerian or they're based in nigeria we are losing a whole lot in the digital economy right now from that reputation however when i speak in this in you know in, on international spaces i use two approaches first i make light of the situation so i have a very famous joke um i say oh i'm a nigerian um but i'm not a princess i want you to process that joke so usually it makes them laugh because they know what i'm saying so i say oh mm -hmm. i'm a nigerian from nigeria living in nigeria but i'm not a princess and why am i doing that is because a nigerian prince is a thing so when i say i'm not a i'm not a princess you automatically put it together nigerian princess and you know what that can stand for for a lot of people outside of nigeria that's not saying that the fraud and all of it is done from nigeria or by nigerians but when you see that a lot of the companies are blocking our ips for example from shopping it tells you a lot they've experienced yeah. quite a lot and they have reason to uh for that animosity in many cases we have a very very bad reputation as well because of our adherence to rule of law if you look at all the components of rule of law whether civil justice whether criminal justice whether government transparency you will see that nigeria ranks very very low amongst all the countries in the world and that's why a lot of laws are not really really even though that they're enforced but the compliance level is very 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 low Although many do not realize, Nigerians are increasingly being restricted from entry by countries around the world. Countries like Dubai and Seychelles were easy to access. As of today, the average Nigerians cannot visit these two states for tourism. Dubai shot visiting Nigerians out in 2022 for reasons that have not been fully disclosed. Although there is speculation that it was tied to the crime rate of Nigerians living in Dubai. Seychelles also banned Nigerians from receiving tourist visas in July 2023. This was reported to be tied to drugs and card fraud. So the thing is, the Nigerian music space has produced so many musicians who have dominated the African and global airwaves. However, there's evidence that many of these musicians serve as town criers for online fraud. It would appear that the floodgates of online fraud propaganda have been fully opened and Nigerian artists have embraced it with reckless abandon. How else do you correct culture when even our music is permeating it? Let's think about it. Every single thing that has grown has come from you know, in being immersed in culture. And fraud is before our very eyes being immersed in our culture. So when a song comes up, even on, even in a wedding, I go and sit down. We received credible information about how the Nigerian entertainment space has become such a good location employed for money laundering. As a result, there are questionable endorsements, questionable music shows, and other questionable activities. The Nigerian music industry, which has stars operating at global levels previously unseen, helps spread the culture of Nigeria, but it is also helping spread a love for Yahoo Yahoo. It is hard to separate the spread of fraud from poverty. Even though poverty is no excuse for crime, it is a motivating factor and recruitment tool. Actually, it's not good, but to me, ah. If the government is not doing anything, I cannot blame them. Because if they have a good job, like they are going out in 7 o'clock and they are coming back in the night, they don't have time to carry their phone, even going to reply someone on, my, uh, on WhatsApp, their family is going to be hard. So they don't have a job and they can't be walking around the streets. 
so they have to do something to it and most of them are poor by law we don't generally consider excuses however we do have certain factors that mitigate a crime as in when a crime has been committed you have some factors that the courts may consider to maybe reduce sentence such as if an accused person is provoked or the person is defending themselves but in terms of uh, poverty as an excuse i would rather say that it's not a, a good excuse to commit crime it's more of um, when you look at it you want to talk about socio-economic factors different factors that can lead to crime and such as maybe an economic downturn or maybe sociological factors such as you know, peer pressure and um, well, you can explain, if you want to look at poverty in terms of crime, commission of crime, you talk about poverty being maybe a factor that led to crime, but you cannot use it as an excuse for committing crime. That doesn't work and it, uh, the law does not recognize it as an excuse for the commission of crime. Just the same way we sent out messages on Ebola and COVID, on washing our hands and keeping a distance. We need to do the same thing about online fraud and shout from the rooftop. It doesn't matter whether we are dealing with Nigerian victims or non-Nigerian victims. We need to let people know that it is wrong because these fraudsters are becoming very, very comfortable and they think that society excuses them. They need to know that that is not the case. In our approach towards solving the problem of online fraud, we will have to review our criminal justice system. First, a lot of people say that the sentencing of fraudsters to light sentences is not helpful. As a result, many people do not even think that fraudsters go to jail. The first fit and purpose law on cybercrime in Nigeria was enacted in 2015. And that gives an idea. And uh, cybercrime has been around for since, for, 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 since decades. So the law is not even playing catch up. We have not even started. We do not have a robust laws on cybercrime. The first law on cybercrime was the Cybercrime Act 2015. And that law, most of the provisions of that law was copied from the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the US enacted in 1986. A lot of those provisions in that US law is already outdated. In fact, the laws has been repealed amended several times and Nigeria still went ahead, the, the legislators still went ahead to copy a lot of provisions in that repealed law of 1986 on cybercrime in the US. It's important that we avoid the mistakes from the past. One of such grave mistakes is the issue of illegal profiling. Nigeria has always had law enforcement issues and the research continually shows that the experience of the vast majority of Nigerians at police stations is a nightmare. Kenechuku Uzoka is a lawyer who provides pro bono services to indigents, including victims of police brutality. Even as a lawyer, he has had his own share of police harassment. I can remember as a very, very young lawyer, my um, principal partner then sent me to um, um, area command in Lagos. You know, I was supposed to go with a client, and um, so that the police can take the client's statements. So I went, and while we went there, I was in the room. Mm -hmm. They got the statement um, sheet. So while the while the while my client then was trying to write the police man there, one policeman, uh, that, that's not even the IPO, said, oh, I shouldn't be there while my client is writing the statement. And I told this man, no, if my client is writing or making a statement, definitely I need to be there so that I would know that my client is not being coerced, mm -hmm. is not being forced, or doesn't feel like she's, she, she, she's going to be under duress. This policeman said, no, that I should walk out of the room. I said, I walk out of the room, but my client won't write anything. So I left the room. Uh, when I left, my client was like, um, they're telling her to write. I said, don't write. If I'm not there, don't write. And this, I was, I, I think I was, I don't think I was up to six months at the bar then. Uh, and the next thing this policeman said, that's, who do I think I am? Who do I think I am? And I should walk out of the police um, compound. I told him definitely I would walk out, but 
I have to go my client, since my client is not under arrest, she just came here to make her statement in the case they were investigating. And, you know, definitely I have to go with her if I'm leaving here. Said no, that she walk out, that who do I think I am? What's wrong with all these small, small lawyers nowadays? I was very young, you know, younger than, <laughs> younger than I look now. And the next thing this man was pointing the barrel of his um, AK-47 rifle on my face. With the spread of laptops and smartphones, policemen did not have to conduct raids on cyber cafes in search of online fraudsters, both real and mostly speculative. Any young person holding a laptop became a suspect. From the reports at the special committees set up by state governments, thousands of young people were victims of the police unit. Even when the illegal activities of SARS was publicized, no concrete effort was taken to rein them in, that is, until end SARS. The protests led to the dissolution of the federal SARS and the setup of another force in its wake. It has been years since the end SARS protests. Illegal police checkpoints remain. Police harassment of youth still goes on. Illegal stop and search exercises by the police is still ongoing. Daniel Lawani works as a professional photographer who focuses on beauty, lifestyle, and advertisement. It's all of these reasons, you know, just being a young creative in Nigeria is almost a Herculean task because you are going out, you don't, you're not assured of you're coming in, you know, just because of sense of vision, you know, someone might just be some of the officials might be drunk, might be high, might be under the influence and you know they they might just act on impulse and God forbid it's just someone's bad day, you know, you just go out and you meet some of those individuals and then before you know it they just shoot at you or shoot at the individual, you know, just because they feel you know, they can, you know, and the government has sadly enabled these people to to an extent because there is no justice being served, you know, or repercussions for these actions. The FCC have been doing their job and they've been doing well. I would I would give it to them. But um, we've seen or we've heard the EFCC going to buildings, jumping to buildings, breaking to houses, sometimes without warrants, you know, carrying out raids. The FCC might decide to come into, um, this happens in mostly student hostels or where young Nigerians are staying and they will raid and arrest everybody who lives in that compound that in addition to taking all the phones, laptop and cars that are parked in that compound. That's not how to carry on this job. Before coming to make an arrest, you would have done would have done some level of um, investigation. So online fraud is also not limited to the activities of individuals. One form of online fraud which easily gets lost in the conversation on fraud is corporate investment fraud. Every single year, Nigerians lose billions of naira to investment scams. In recent years, many of these scams have been for business or investment prospects in logistics, crypto, forex, agritech, and other subsectors. These corporate investment schemes fall into two categories. One, Ponzi schemes. Two, pyramid schemes. So these are schemes where people lose monies to fake investments. They have promises of high returns. In Ponzi schemes, the investor only needs to bring money or some other valuable. In the pyramid scheme, the returns hinge on the investor bringing in other people and those other people bringing in others and those others, others and others and on and on. At an event in December 2022, 
the director of the Bank Examination Department at the Nigeria Deposit Insurance Company, NDIC, Michael Oladili, disclosed that no less than 911.45 billion naira has been lost to various Ponzi schemes and related frauds across the country in the last 23 years. That is, nearly 1 trillion naira lost to corporate scams. In the last five years in Nigeria, we have seen several companies raise funds from the public for business operations without any form of registration with SEC. But many of them turned out to be plain and simple Ponzi schemes. They promised investors heaven, but not long after the initial taste, they began to fall down to the earth like a pack of cards. There was NBA Forex, Rack Sterling, Imagine Global, Chinmark Group, FinAfrica Investments, OFPB by Uvaiza, Each Rich Farms, Hatchy Farms, the list goes on and on and on. There was also Agro Partnerships and its parent company, Farmfort. The illegal activities of some of these companies has received judicial censor. For example, the Investment and Securities Tribunal has found that the promoters of agro-partnerships and farm fort were running an illegal scheme. The EFCC has also declared the co-founders of the scheme wanted. Agro-partnerships was once the darling of Agritech. At the height of the company, several thousands of individuals and companies invested in Naira and dollar-denominated investment schemes by the company. The company promised high returns and was faithful in repaying at the initial phase until it could no longer sustain the facade. Our investigation included extended conversation with hundreds of victims and interviews of several lawyers involved in attempts to recover monies belonging to the investors. We also examined reports from engagement of these legal representatives with the SEC and EFCC. We spoke to several victims of agro-partnerships investment scams, including two older Nigerians who invested their funds on the recommendation of their younger family members. Mrs. Ogedenbe is a Nigerian based in a European city. She invested several millions in agro-partnerships, monies which she had earmarked for a major project. Please share with us how you came to know about Agro Partnerships Farm Fund. I came to know about it through a family member. It was actually a family member of my husband who introduced him and he told me and we both decided to go in on it together. What particular investments did you invest in? Because I know they had different agricultural products that they raised money for. The first one we invested in was in April 2021, which was the Farm Ford Food Valley, and that was supposed to be an investment where you get your money in four trenches. You get the interest three times, and the fourth one you get back with your capital. And then we also invested in the poultry called Poultry O2. That started um, also in 2021 May, and in February 2022, you would get your money back as well as the interest. So prior to investing in these companies, what uh, kind of due diligence did you conduct on them? When I was first informed about the company, as I've never invested in that kind of company before, I looked into it online. I also got the contact number for the CEO, one of the co-CEOs, Mr. Osasua Osai, and I spoke to him at length. I asked him where the farm was, where he was carrying out his activities. He explained to me that they had various farmers which they were assisting and that it's actually for people who want to go into farming and cannot do it because either they, are, they don't have the expertise or they're not around. So they will then work with the farmers and make the products work and they will get a bit of the investment as well. And he explained to me that it was. I asked him also about the probability of crops failing and what measures he had taken. He said they are, we were fully insured that the products themselves were insured and also our capital is separately insured and if anything were to happen the worst scenario would be that we'll get the capital back because it is already insured. I would like to ask was this your first investment 
in a private company in Nigeria that was raising money through crowdfunding or have you invested in any prior agritech scheme or a similar scheme? Fortunately, it's not something I'd ventured into. If I wasn't introduced to it by a family member, it's not something I would normally do. And the family member that introduced us was a risk manager and I just thought, well, she probably had done due diligence. I'd also interrogated the co-CEO as well. So I hadn't had any experience of such thing prior to that. Now, prior to the default by Agro Partnerships and Farm 40, did you get any returns from the investment before um, the returns stopped coming? There were two types of investments we did. The first one was uh, Farm Food Food Valley, which was the one that was supposed to be paid out in four trenches. Two lots of interest were paid, and the third one that was due in January never came. The last one in April that should have come with the capital never came. The second one, which was the poultry, called poultry 02, that was never paid at all. The one that was supposed to match up in 2022, April, never got paid. How did you find out that the company was not going to be able to pay you um, any longer? How did you get to know about it? And what was the reason put forward by the company for their inability to pay? From my um, conversation with the co-CEO, what he told me was that they were trying to make payments, they were trying to come to an agreement with uh, EFCC and SEC, and once their accounts have been unfrozen, they will start making payments. And that was just a little problem that they were able to rectify. But unfortunately, I haven't spoken to the Netherlands CEO. That's not the same story. His story is that they diverted the funds for this project they were doing, and they were also spending it on their own lifestyle and that's why the problem became so bad because they were not doing the right thing. they were sending wrong or bad or adulterated things or cheaper articles instead of what because they wanted to make a, a good returns for themselves by holding back some of the fun and that was because they mismanaged and they were enriching themselves that's why the project went bad that was what the Netherlands um, CEO said how has these defaults by Agro Partnerships Farm 40 affected you or your family um, financially or in any other way? Oh yes, it has actually affected me both mentally and financially because mentally I've always been one that had a good experience of growing up in Nigeria and I've always longed that you okay, can, no matter how long I live abroad, you have to go home one day and when I go home, my plan is to give something back to the country that give me what give me the strength to come out and be who I am. And the business I want to start in Nigeria, I was just building up funds to start. I cannot see that happening now because so much has been lost. Also, it's just the kind of experience it gives for my children with me always talking about going to Nigeria and wanting them to get involved in the business I want to do. There's no confidence anymore in investing in Nigeria. And the saddest part of it is people in the family who rely on me for school fees, for rent, accommodation, help with all sort of problems, especially when they are ill. Anyone that asks me for funds now, sadly, I really don't have anything to give because you can only give what you have. If you have another opportunity to invest in any scheme or any investment opportunity in Nigeria um, in the future, do you see yourself doing that? I will have to tell you a joke to end this. I said, if both my parents come back from the dead, and they wanted to go into a business with me in Nigeria. I wouldn't. I hope that answers your question. It does. It does. So sorry about that. Another one of the victims who spoke with us, a retiree based in North Central Nigeria who prefers to be anonymous. One of my son introduced me to that uh, agro partnership and uh, he, uh, he, he showed me that the investment was insured that there's no way anything will be anything negatively will happen to my money, that my money is safe. And I saw it in their in their something that the investment is insured. Then I invested about uh, 3.8 million, which is my pension's money. For the past some times now, in fact, there's no day I will not cost them, their generation. And my calls is going to, I know, unless they pay me my money back. Mm. Uh -huh. That's just, I know them through one of my son. He introduced okay. me to them because some of his friends are doing it. 
then it was get the guarantee that my son told uh, told me was the insurance that the investment was insured. That's that's the reason I invested, and it's not too bad. It's not that I look very desperate or um or that um, it's not something that they say you, know, you invest hundred, you get hundred. Mm-hmm. The list is starting forty, which is not too bad. Yeah. But ending of the day, we go down here. I cannot even access their website anymore. Were there any red flags like before everything happened where you couldn't access their website? Were there any red flags along the way that made you think, uh uh-uh, this is not looking like Yeah, it was when the there was a time the first one I was invested, they pay they pay, they pay dividends of ninety thousand. Mm-hmm. It was after that that they are now holding a meeting that they are that they are in crisis. That ending of that month, they were they extended the date. They are due to pay another t- dividends. Yeah, they are giving different, different, different excuses. Mm-hmm. And uh, they even went off the line. They couldn't. They are called initially. You could uh, you could give them a call. They pick. But now it doesn't pick any call. We couldn't mm-hmm. access their website anymore. So now they are totally unresponsive. No, completely unresponsive at the moment. One thing stands clear, online fraud is more pervasive than the average Nigerian realizes. In fact, the majority of the Nigerians watching this documentary will know at least one person who is engaged in or someone who was a victim of online fraud. Now in Nigeria, there are the onlookers, maybe you and I who know but can do little about it. The onlookers do not support it or they don't even care so much as to hold a strong opinion about it. Then, there are the sympathizers who though not directly involved in online fraud themselves, they excuse it away, either absolutely or to some extent. They have one reason or the other as to why online fraud is not that bad. Then there are the beneficiaries, the friends, parents, siblings, and other people who live off the fraudsters. Finally, you have the fraudsters themselves and their associates who aid and abet them in their fraudulent activities. Sadly, as it is with most crimes, whenever a people overlook or embrace a crime, it always ends up overpowering them. Think about drugs. Think about terrorism. 